pitch pipe, please. Um, Ashira la Yehua ki ga'o ga'a. Ashira la Yehua ki ga'o ga'a. Mi chamocha ba'elim Yehua. Mi chamocha ne'edar ba'kodesh nachi. Bechastecha am zuga alta, Nachita bechastecha am zuga alta, Ashira, Ashira, Ashira. What do I think of when I think of, or when the scrolls roll, you roll the scrolls, and the book of Bereshit comes to an end, all right? Chazak, Chazak, Benit, Chazek, we say. Uh, strengthen, strengthen, and be strengthened. And we start the book of Shemot. Duh! I think of the signature, the signature event, the calling card. That's what I want to call it. The event of the Exodus is so huge in the Tanakh, in the Bible as a whole. Why is that? Well, it is the signature event that sets everything in motion, that sets everything in motion. Think about it. The one who is, who was, and who will always be, bends time in order to interject his creative force, his power, and his will, and to spread his name, okay, and everything that comes along with his name. That's the, the, the subject of what we're talking about today, what we're going to talk about. The name, the name, his name. He spreads the fame of his name. He says basically to the creation who before then really didn't know him, by the way, hello, I exist. Um, this is the, 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 the signature event of the book that sets everything in motion. It is the greatest revelation of the Most High to mankind before the advent of Mashiach, before the advent of Mashiach. Okay, uh, so I think about uh, the Exodus, and I think about uh, the crossing of the sea and the song, the singing of the Mi Chamocha, who is like unto you, Yehovah, Most High, right? Nora uh, Tehilot Osefele, you are awesome, awesome in praise, doing wonders so great. Mi Chamocha Beilim, who is like you among those things which would be called a god? Ain, ain, there is none. There is none. I want to take you first before we look at the encounter of Moshe uh, with the Most High when he makes himself known to him. I want to go back, back to set the foundation. What is it with name? The, you know, name, when we say, what is a person's name? You know, or in the modern Hebrew, you know, ech korim lecha, how do you call to someone? You ask a person, ech korim lecha, how do they call to you? You know, Mashmo, or what is your name? Mashimcha, uh, and on and on and on. But what did it mean to the ancients back in the day? The connotation of Shem, or name, what did it fully mean? We're going to get uh, an answer from the book if we go back to chapter 48 of Bereshit, Bereshit, and we're going to look at when Yaakov is preparing to bless uh, Yosef and the two boys, Ephraim and Menashe, Ephraim and Menashe. And I want you to listen to some of the language that uh, Yaakov uses when he's getting ready to bless his son and his two uh, grandsons. Uh, if we pick it up um, um, in verse number 16, in verse number 16 it reads as follows. This is Yaakov speaking. He already has the boys in front of him. Okay. And he says in verse 16, uh, he started out in 15 saying, more or less, may the Most High bless Yosef, and on and on and on. And then he adds this, Hamala'ach Eloti, the messenger or the angel, okay, who delivered me or redeemed me, Mikol Ra, from all evil, Yevarech et Ne'arim, bless these two young men. Bless these two young men. Now keep in mind, keep in mind this fact that... Uh, these aren't little bitty kids, really, um, anymore, because you remember that um, 
Yaakov lived in Egypt for a good little while before he passed away. So these are young men here. So he calls them Ne'arim. He says, bless these uh, Ne'arim. And listen to this. This is what he's asking of the Most High. Vayikra bahim shmi. And, call, and have them called by my name. He's going to change the boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, he's going to change their names to Yaakov. No, that's not what it's saying. Stay with me. Vayikra bahem bishmi v'shim avotai Avraham v'yitzchak and have them also be called by the name of my fathers, by the name of Avraham and Yitzchak and that they would team, meaning multiply, that they would team. And a very interesting thing about that word, the root word of is the word dag, dag or fish, that they would team uh, as a people group, grow and team as a people group in the middle of the land. And if you look later on at the land, uh, portions, the way the lands were, uh, portion of the lands were, uh, land was allotted, you'll see that Ephraim and Manasseh got two of the bigger pieces of the territory right in the middle of the land. As Yaakov said when he blessed them and he asked of the Most High. So name is not just what someone calls you. Uh, it's not just that thing that someone yells out and then you turn around, okay? Like me, my name is David, David, Daoud in Arabic. Many places that I go, if someone yells out uh, David, um, David, or Daoud, 10, 15 people in the crowd will turn around and look. But name is much, much more. Uh, name means authority. Name means reputation. Uh, name uh, has uh, carries uh, the connotation of what is the character of that person or that individual? Uh, how is it that they made themselves to be known? What is their fame? What is their notoriety? Okay, what is it? All right, so having established that as a basis, let's go to uh, Shmot or Exodus chapter 3, where Moshe is tending uh, the sheep. Yes, he had already left from Egypt uh, because he got snitched on. You know, I talked about this, uh, made a couple of quips with the people uh, last night that I was uh, blessed enough to be able to um, share Shabbat with. And we talked about if you want to know where the advent of dry snitching came in, well, it came in way back when Moshe sees some of his fellow men, uh, brothers, being, being beaten by an Egyptian, and he takes the Egyptian out. And then later on, you know, the thing becomes known. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you know, who better to dog you out than, you know, your own folks? Not making an excuse for Moshe or whatever or how he was brought up in the house of Egypt or whatever. But hey, he got this guy off of you and, you know, he, you know, consequently he killed the guy. But nonetheless, you gave up the information. So if you want to know where dry snitching had its advent, uh, ancient Egypt, okay, from the mouth of, of yours truly, our own folk. Uh, but let's go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, and this is where Moshe is tending the sheep for his father-in-law, Yitro, okay, and he starts moving uh, the sheep, and he comes near to Har HaElohim, the mountain of the God, mountain of the God. We're going to go to chapter 3. And pick it up and let's start at the top of the chapter. It says, Umoshe haya roet son yitro chotno kohen midian. Moshe was the uh, shepherd of the sheep for his father in law yitro, who was the kohen or the priest of midian. Vayin ha getat son achar midbar, vayavo el har ha elohim choreva. So he is tending and managing the sheep, yin hag managing the sheep. And he starts to take the sheep in the direction as they grazed toward the mountain of Ha Elohim, the mountain of the God. Again, don't get triggered. I'm just using the phrase loosely here. God. Uh, Choreva, or toward Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb. Verse 2. Vayira malach Yehua elav belabat esh mitoch And the messenger. Malach Yahuwah, the messenger, not the creator himself, 
but the messenger of the Most High appeared to him in a flame of fire inside of a thorn bush. Stop. Let's talk about, isn't that so like the Most High? Isn't that so like him based on what we see um, throughout the length of scripture? We find that he takes the smallest and the most lowliest things, right? And he uses that. It's 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 the base uh, or, or, or humble or lowly, he uses these things, uh, not only with inanimate objects, okay, but he also does it with people from out of uh, Ephrata, uh, Bethlehem, Ephrata, where Rachel was buried uh, when she passed away, and uh, Yaakov buried her there, uh, out of the, the smallest clans of Yehuda, out of you will come to me, uh, to the world, uh, the one uh, who will be the ruler and the redeemer uh, whose origins are from old and from everlasting. It's from the small things. It's not just the big things, but it's the small things um, he will magnify, right? Um, so um, a thorn bush, sne, the word sne, a thorn bush, um, he could have chose a lot of big majestic ways in order to make an appearance, but he does so in a single flame of fire inside of, of all things, a thorn bush, something that gets blown around and rolled around uh, in the wind and the desert of Sin, Sin, you've seen that in your Bible, it looks like it's saying Sin, the desert of Zen or Sin, the desert or Midbar Sin is just, um, it's a desert uh, or a wilderness area that's filled with nothing but Useless thorn bushes, right? Okay, uh, moving on. So he sees this. And here are the characteristics. It says, So the thorn bush is engulfed with this internal, internal flame but it is lo ukal. It's not consumed. It's not consumed. I'd want to see too. So, naturally, what happens in the next verse, in verse 3, Vayomer Moshe, Moses says, Asurana ve Let me wander closer, wander closer, so I can look at this mar e this great marvel or this great appearance, this great spectacle that I'm looking upon. And he wants to know, why does not the thorn bush just go up in flames? Even though it's on fire, it's not being consumed. Verse 4, and here comes the event. Vayar Yehua kisar lirot. And the Most High saw that Moses was straying, sar. He was straying toward the spectacle to see what it is or what it was. And here's what the Most High does. Vayikra elav Elohim mitochasne vayomer Moshe. Moshe vayomer hineni. So from inside of the flame, which was inside of the thorn bush, the Most High calls out through the messenger and he says, Moshe. Moshe, he calls his name twice. Now keep in mind that when we go further in the Torah, uh, we'll find that the Torah and the prophets as well, that when the Most High calls out twice to a person, is usually something very urgent or it's very endearing. For example, when he called out to the young prophet and he called out, uh, I believe it was Eli, I think, Eli, it could be. I think he said Eli, Eli. And he didn't know what to do, so he asked, and he was told, next time you hear your voice, uh, your name being called out like this, just say, Hineni, or here I am. Um, from the standpoint of a sense of urgency, Abraham is ready to sacrifice his one and only son, Yitzchak. And in urgency, the Most High called out through his messenger again, Abraham, Abraham, you know, and he stops. Don't harm the boy. So it can be either urgency or typically it is a term of endearment. So he calls out Moshe, Moshe, and he says, he answers, Hineni, Hineni, here I am. Now, in verse 5, 
it says, Vayomer, and he said, speaking of the Most High, Al tikrav halom, shal na'alecha me'al raglecha, ki hamakom asher atar med alav admat kodesh hu. Don't come any closer. Take off the shoes from your feet, because the land or indoor, the ground that you're standing on, it is holy. Admat kodesh hu. It is holy ground. Now, this is not ground inside of the Holy Land proper as we know, but anywhere the Spirit of the Most High is, anywhere where the Spirit of the One who is, was, and always will be is, that area has to bend, that area has to meld, and it has to transform to that which occupies it. It becomes holy. It's the same thing as us as individuals. Uh, from individuals, there's a saying that goes around in the greater uh, Torah-keeping world, uh, from the sand or from the desk we were made, and, from, and to that sand or desk we will return. We are earth. We are ground. We are Adama in our making up. Uh, so when he fills and when he indwells us, this is why, in part, we are Definitely, we are considered holy. We are, uh, uh, we are apportioned. We are dedicated to. We belong to uh, the greater, uh, the greater collective. This is what binds us. Is the spirit of, of the Most High. So, when that which is holy invades that which is common, common has to yield. Common has to yield and give way uh, to holy. So let's continue here. He tells him to take the shoes off from his feet from the ground that you're standing on is holy. Now, if we jog on down from that point, because we are very familiar with uh, that aspect of the story, but what we're trying to focus on is the name. The name. The name and what his name entails. What his name uh, entails. He goes on to say that I've seen the suffering of my people, okay, Asher Mitzrayim, Ve'etzo'akatam, Shamati Mipnei Nigshav, and I've heard their cries because of all of the heat that's been placed on them, because of, of uh, all of the pressure that has been uh, put on him, uh, put on the people. But here comes the heart of the matter here. Moshe has made a couple excuses here and there. But Moshe wants to know, well, if I, when I go before these people, they're going to want to know some details. They're going to want to know some details, you know. If we pick it up in verse 13, uh, Moshe says this. He says, Hine, anochi ba el bnei Yisrael ve'amarti lahem, I will go before the children of Israel, the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, Elohe avotechem shlachani alechem, the Elohim of your forefathers has sent me. And they will say to me, Mashmo, Mashmo, what is his name? Ma'amar lahem, ma'amar alechem, what do I say to them? So let's stop for a second. Think about the fact that, again, we're talking about the understanding of a people when they hear a term like name being used. I mean, we're talking thousands of years ago. What did it fully entail? That's why I laid down the foundation to you by looking at chapter 48 of Bereshit. It meant much more than just a handle, a handle or something that someone uh, is called. And we understand that from what we read in... in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 48, but we'll also get an understanding of it by the way that the question is answered by the Most High. Look at how, look at how he answers it. So Moshe says, you know, Mashmo, Ma'amar Alehem, what do I say to them? What do I say to them? In verse 14, here's how the Most High answers. Vayomer Elohim el Moshe eheye asher eheye. I will be what I will be. You notice he didn't say, my name is Ehiyeh Asher Ehiyeh. He did not say that. 
He did not start his statement with, my name is. He answered Moshe's question by making a statement related to his being, meaning that the understanding is that they want to know, Mashmo, how will he make himself revealed? How will he make himself known? Because this is how the Most High answers the question. I will be what I will be. Now, I know you've heard many times, I am that I am, and yada, yada, yada. That's, that's I'm not going to say that it's downright uh, deceptive, uh, but what I'm saying is that to use the term I am that I, that I am also helps to drive a theological point in the New Testament. Agree or disagree with that theological viewpoint and or point. To me, it's a little bit of an extrapolation because literally he's saying, I will be what I will be. Ehe, asher ehe. I will be what I will be. And he goes on to say a verse later, tell them that I will be has sent you. Uh, and that was found in verse 14. I will be has sent you. Now, here is where he gives the name. The name, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, I have uh, talked about these points in an older video that I did maybe a year ago called His Name is Everything. I think it's maybe a, a seven or eight minute video. If you're uh, interested, you can go and look at it as well. Um, but here is where he answers properly, this is what I'm called. Because his first answer, he is revealing the state of his being. When the time comes to show how he is will present himself, he says, whatever I will be, that's what I will be. You'll see it in my action. Okay? As far as they know right now, nothing really comes pretty much, even with, with his proper name, once he gives his proper name in this next verse, nothing really comes with it of reputation because they simply don't know much of him. A lot of time uh, has passed. All of, uh, Yosef has passed. All of his brothers have passed. That whole generation has passed. You know, they probably lived very willy-nilly as they pro, uh, pro uh, uh, created and uh, exploded throughout the land and only the elders, a handful of the graybeards, probably held on to the knowledge of who he was in some way. But he, in a sense, with this calling card and with his intro, uh, introducing himself into time and moving and affecting things, he's building the reputation that we know of today. Okay? All right, keep that thought in mind. Verse 15, here's where he gives his name, what he's called by, literally. Vayomer od Elohim, and Elohim continued and said, Mo on el Moshe to Moshe, ko tomar el bnei Israel. This is what you are to say to the children of Israel. Yehuah, yud he vav he. Yehuah, yud he vav he. Elohe avotechem, Elohe Avraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Velohe Yaakov, shlachani alechem. That yud he vav he, Yehuah, the Elohim of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, has sent me. And then he goes on and says, Ze shmi le'olam, veze zichri le'dor dor. Ze shmi le'olam, this is my name forever. Zichri le'dor dor. This is my memorial from generation to generation. Let's stop there and pull out the old faithful whiteboard. So, he gives him, being Moshe, he gives him the name yud He vav He. yud He vav and He. Gives him yud He vav He. yud He vav He. he gives him the name Yehuah, Yehuah. Okay, so before we even get to pronunciations and the struggle behind uh, the struggles between the warring factions over how the name is presented or how the name is pronounced, rather, let's talk about the components that make 
up the name grammatically. Grammatically, let's talk about those. So, Yud He Vav He Yahuwah, contained within the name of the Most High, are the three uh, forms of the verb to be. Of the verb to be. Haya was. Haya, in the green letters there, Haya was. Hove is. Hove. Hove. Down here on the side. Haya was. Hove is. And then finally, Yihie. Yihie will be. Yihie. Hmm. So within the name, within the name, we have the three forms of the verb to be. Haya was. Hove is. And Yihie. The hu haya, the hu hove. The hu ihie letifara. He was, he is, he will be. All of those things summed up together are found within the name Yahuwah. Literally, I exist. I always have been. I am right now. I'm past and beyond all your future in whatever measurement of time that you have. Time is something that we sit inside of, and he is outside of it. It's his creation. So he can interject things into it as he pleases. I am. I literally exist. So, you know, there are a couple of ways that the name is, is viewed or called, okay, in the greater Torah-keeping world. One is Shem HaMithorash. Shem HaMithorash. Shem HaMithorash. So Shem HaMithorash literally means uh, the ineffable name. The revealed name, the explicit meforash, forash, uh, forash should sound kind of familiar to you. Perush, prushim, Pharisee, uh, interpreted or explicit or or laid out. Um, it's distinct. Okay, this is his personal name, and as he said, it is zichri. It is my name, le dor dor, zishmi le olam. Lidor, door from generation to generation, forever and forever. This is my name. Another way in which it is known is it's also known as Shem HaMeforash was the first one you heard. The next one is Shem HaChavaya. Shem Shem HaChavaya. Shem HaChavaya. Chavaya. Um, carries a connotation of experience, something palpable, something that can be experienced or, or grasped. Uh, this is a way to personally know. Um, this is a name that's given only to an inner circle um, uh, of those who belong. So Shem HaMeforash and Shem Chavaya, the explicit name, the distinct name, okay, but also the experiential name. Of the name uh, in which you will experience him and know him. And boy, did he ever make himself unknown, uh, not only to his people, right, but also to uh, Egypt, the most powerful uh, kingdom of the world at its time and the most idolatrous, the most abominable and wicked, okay? All of Egypt and its would-be uh, gods were judged were judged uh, through uh, the Exodus and what the Most High did by way of his name. What else? Okay, what else are we going to talk about? Well, the last part that we're going to talk about is the whole war over the pronunciation. The whole war over the proper pronunciation of the name. Okay, some subscribe to Yehovah. Some uh, subscribe to Yehovah. Others 
Yahuwah, Yehuwah, some uh, people subscribe to Yahweh. Now again, let's work together. We don't have to fight, and we, we're not going to always agree. This is why I am a huge fan of uh, the circumlocutions or terms or names that are used because when you don't know, you just don't know. Uh, so, some have adopted Hashem. Hashem. Now, I hear people beat that beat that up and talk about it really bad. Okay, but Hashem literally means the name. The name, Hashem. Okay, uh, because for some, if they don't really know, they want to err on the side uh, of caution. So they will call him Hashem. Okay, others will use the term Adonai. Adonai, which simply means Lord, okay? But for others, and I understand them, for others, they feel like they have something that's close enough or they feel like they have something there that's set, uh, that has been established by the scholars over time and over, over uh, years that is close enough. There are little telltale signs and markers um, that kind of point the way and show us. Like, for example, I shared with a group last night that Yahoo, Yahoo is a form of the name um, that has been used and has been documented through multiple cultures. Uh, these cultures that speak a Semitic language have used uh, a shortened form of the, na of the name uh, Yahoo. Also, if you look at the name of the prophets, a lot of the prophets will end in Yahoo. For example, we have Eliyahu. Eliyahu, Elijah, Eliyahu, Eli, my God, is Yahu, Yahu. Now you might say, well, where's where's the vav on the end, the cholim that would, uh, or the uh, the kibbutz uh, that would make that? Well, again, these are traditions, and notice I did say traditions orally carried down, orally carried down. All right, that gives the Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Yirmi Yahu, Jeremiah, Yirmi, uh, exalted is Yahu, Yirmi, okay, exalted is Yahu. The root word in Yirmi Yahu is Ram, 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 like exalted uh, and or lifted up. Also, Ram, that's the in in the, uh, the primarily uh, Arab or Muslim town of Ramallah, this is also the uh, part of the root of that, Ram. Okay. Speaking of the handle for Islam's God, we can, I can show you the correlation between these pronunciations and why they are so close. Because Semitic languages um, all have a lot of the similar words, or it's the exact same words with a different pronunciation. Like, for example, the very first uh, encounter of what we would translate as God in the Bible, in the Tanakh, comes in the form of Eloha. Eloha. All right? And I'm just going to cancel it for you visually, you know, so it won't be any confusion. Eloha. Eloha. All right? So in this case, you know the rule, if you're familiar with the rule of the Hebrew. The last letter is a guttural letter, like a chet or a he. Whatever vowel is underneath it is pronounced first, and then that last part. Eloa. Eloa. Now, you can tell that, you know, we get Elohim from Eloa. Eloa is singular. Elohim, in, its, in the form uh, that it presents itself, is not saying gods, of course. That's another... Uh, a topic for a different video, and it's probably not even necessarily because it's widely known. But Eloha is this singular construct form, but Elohim in and of itself carries a pluralistic ending that does not denote plurality as far as quantity of entities, 
but it's more of a majestic or superlative situation. So now how does that tie in or how is it related to the other Semitic languages and their use of the generic term God? Okay, so you have uh, in Sufism, if you're uh, familiar with Sufism, they have a form of that they use of uh, of God, and I'm going to write this with English letters here. He is called Huwa. Huwa. Sorry about that. In Sufism, God is called Huwa. Huwa. So in Arabic, in Arabic, the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word, in Arabic, the Arabic word to say he, like if you're going to say he, he is nice. Okay, you would say Huwa, Huwa Ahmad, Huwa Ahmad. Okay, Huwa means he is. Do you see the, uh, the, the, the connection? Yahu, okay, Yahuwa. Huwa in Sufism, which literally means he is. Um, you've heard the, uh, the thing with, within uh, Islam where people will say, don't be triggered. I'm just making a, a, an example here. Allahu, 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 God, he is. Literally, God, he is. And then they'll add akhbar. Akhbar are great, right? Usually, sadly, in some cases, there's a loud boom that follows after that. Uh, but it's something that's chanted and shouted and yelled out, okay? Allahu, you know. Uh, it's also a theological statement. Allah, he is, right? Uh, so in Hebrew, we have the word hu. Hu means he is. Huwa in Arabic means he is. But it is also in Sufism, huwa is also a name for, a, dis, a generic name for God. See the correlation between huwa and yahuwa, and it's virtually the same. Um, also, for example, you have the thing that uh, Muslims uh, have to say. Uh, they say, um, uh, La ilaha illa, and then what's his face? So La, again, it's, it's Arabic is, modern day Arabic is polished up Aramaic. So La is the same as Lo in Hebrew. I'm going to show you how close this is. So if I was to write that statement that they make in Hebrew, it would be, and I'll write it in script, uh, in block a little bit, you know, to help you guys out, because I know I've been using script here. So, um, simply put, it would be lo, eloha, ella. Elohai. So you might think that what the Muslims say, even though we're talking about separate entities now, I stand firmly on that. Don't think I'm conflating here or being syncretic in any type of way. The Elohim of Israel is the only, is the only Elohim. Um, he doesn't share his glory with anyone else. And he doesn't go by any handles as we saw uh, in the scripture. This is my name forever, okay? Uh, Allah of the Quran has never identified himself, itself, as yud Vavhe. vav -Hey. No, they ain't even cousins. They ain't even partners. They don't know each other. One's name should never even be mentioned in conjunction with the one and true only Elohim. I want to put that forward. No disrespect to my many Muslim friends, uh, people who I love and respect, but we part ways when it comes to faith, and that should be okay. So, in Hebrew, you would see that if you listen to what uh, Muslims say, or if you're familiar with it, you'll see the correlation and how closely they're related. So, Muslims say, La ilaha, la, la ilaha, la ilaha illa, and they say Allah. In Hebrew, you look at it, it's Lo eloha illa, elohai. You see how close that is? It's that close, okay? 
Um, one says el, the other one says il. Plain and simple. It's not uh, much more difficult. Uh, it's, it's that simple. Okay, finally. Finally, do we remember when he said that this is my name uh, forever? And he says that it is a memorial to be remembered from generation to gener generation. Uh, the word there, um, uh, let's see, I wrote it down here for the Strong's Concordance, for those of you who uh, employ the Strong's Concordance. Zichri, Zichri, Shim Zichri, memorial name. That word Zikaron, Zikaron, spelled with a Zain, Kaf, Resh, Vav, and Anun Sofit. Zain, Kaf, Resh, Vav, and Anun Sofit is Strong's number H2146. H2146. What's significant about him saying, Zeshim Zichri Leolam Ledor Do? This is my memorial name forever and forever. It's because Zeker, Zeker, or Zicharon means much more than memory or to remember. It means also to mention. Also to mention. This is why you have modern Hebrew words like for a secretary. Secretary, maskeret, maskeret, is one who mentions and reminds. Okay? So how can you have a sacred and a holy name that he wants to be memorialized and he wants it to be known for forever if no one is mentioning it? So this is the error of the, the error the mistake of the Jewish world in um, always using circumlocutions like um, Hashem and Adonai extensively because ultimately you keep the name from being heard. Now, I understand, keep in mind, we have to, you know, be a little sensitive here and understand that you don't want his known name to just be trashed and thrown around. You don't want people sticking it in rock and roll songs. Um, or swearing at their children with it or whatever. I get that notion, but people are going to kind of kind of do what they want to do, and you know you can hope for the best. But we see throughout the word that he tells the people to bless each other and use his name. So it's not that the pronunciation has been lost wholly; it's just not fully exactly known. Even with Yahuwah, I will admit that I subscribe to. There is an awesome and a great uh, case for Yehovah, which isn't very different, you know, as is cantillated in the codices, like in the Leningrad Codex and also in the Aleppo Codex. In the Aleppo Codex, claim to fame is that it was proofread by the Rabbi Moshe uh, bin Maimon Rambam, uh, short, uh, not terribly long, not terribly long after it was written down after it was uh, the Aleppo Codex in the Galilee in the 5th or maybe 6th century, um, that it was proofread and approved by the Rambam, who saw the cancellation of the name and had no problem with it. So we can we can surmise from that that far back, a certain number of generations, um, that this pronunciation had been passed on even to uh, Moshe uh, bin Maimon to this guy, okay, so he approved of it, all right? Um, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the way it's cantillated, there's a strong case for Yehu, Yehovah, instead of Yehovah, because Wah is always, it's been Wah in ancient times. It wasn't always Vav, and we know this. So Yehovah versus Yehovah is not very different. It's U versus O, plain and simple, and I can live with that. So I guess my admonishment would be lovingly to my brothers and sisters is don't be dogmatic about it because none of us truly fully know, but he does know our hearts. He does know our hearts and he knows what, uh, what our intentions are, what we're driving toward. Okay, so in a nutshell, that's it, you guys. I wanted to talk to you about the name, okay? Um, the authority that comes along with it, the characteristics that come along with it, the reputation that would be built up on it. You know, in modern pop culture, we hear uh, mention of people and say, oh, his name is, is basically mud. He's done in business. He'll never be able to land a contract again. Uh, we don't want that uh, to be said of us, but we understand that it's more than just what a person is called. 
Okay, it's what they've done and what they've built up uh, from the past. Okay, so that when you call on that person's name, you understand that you think of everything that comes along with him or her. What is it that they've done? What is it that they've done? What is it that they have established? And finally, I told a group of people on Shabbat at a service yesterday that it was very fitting that Shabbat landed on not only the day that people call Christmas Day, uh, but it landed on the opening of the book of Exodus. Why? Is because a lot of people forget. When we think of Moedim or Chagim, appointed times or festivals, we always think of the you know what we consider to be the big ones. You know, Shavuot, Pesach, um, uh, Sukkot, and all of these others, right? But we forget about Shabbat. Shabbat is a Mikre Kodesh, Mikra E Kodesh. It is a holy calling out for people to come together and to assemble, yes? It is, uh, you will find like in some of the prayer books, it says, uh, it's uh, Zecher uh, Litziat Mitzrayim. It is the first among our sacred assemblies that bring Zecher, remembrance, or bring causes us to recall the exodus for, from Egypt. Why? Because when we were brought out, of that captivity, one of the first things that we did, one of the first things that we did was that we kept Shabbat, that we kept Shabbat. So not only rest for the body, but rest for the soul as well. And I would think after such a long period of being under that bondage, 100 plus years inside of the land of Egypt, is that the bodies needed to learn how to rest, uh, but also the soul but also the soul. Um, and then finally, also, on a lot of platforms, I've been hearing people now talk more and more about Shabbat. And there's a reason why Shabbat and the keeping of Shabbat is always under attack by Christian organizations, you know, not to mention the, the two-letter uh, folks, the UA folks or whatever. Um, Shabbat is something, it's like the Exodus in Egypt. That's why they're, they're really, they're really, they're intertwined, zivizish uh, shluvim. They're they're intertwined and interwrapped, because Shabbat is an argument from silence. It's something that needs not be said. Um, it's something that doesn't need to be beat home in New Testament writings. You know, because this is something that's known. That's known. I mean, think about the Judeans again, who came off of captivity and had just come back into the land. And they're coming off, an, off of a captivity that was a direct, direct, direct result. Get it out, David. You know, feel like, um, what's his name? Porky Pig here, non-kosher. It was as a direct result of breaking and profaning the Shabbat. They had to stay in the captivity for 70 years to make up for all of the Shabbats that they had broken, plus the land Shabbatot that they had broken, right? So this is why the men of the Great Assembly got together. And they put together some fences. Fences are not all bad, okay? But what happens when those good intentions and you put fences up, other people start adding fences on top of fences, on top of fences, till it, till it becomes overwhelming. These things, whether it be with Shabbat or food laws or X, Y, and Z, these are the oral uh, arguments known during the time of Yeshua and his shrichim was known as uh, Mesoret Hazkenim, Mesoret Hazkenim, the transmissions of the bearded ones, the traditions of the elders. Some of these things are good, some of these things are great, but if they're ever put up, if they're ever put up side by side with the writ, they have to either take a second seat or get off the table as a whole, okay? They are to never supersede. And this was the argument of Yeshua, okay? And this was the argument of all of his disciples, which got them into peril. But the argument of Shabbat, they knew better coming into the land not to break it. So when Yeshua has the encounter with a young man and, 
hey, if you would have eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? Oh, this one, this one, this one, and this one. It's not necessary to mention Shabbat. And the weak argument that Christianity has against keeping the Shabbat is downright embarrassing. And you think about the sway of uh, minhagim, minhagim tradition, you know, uh, as bad as they talk about Pharisees and the rabbinic types, the sway that tradition has over Christianity, you know, where you had great minds, like, uh, I don't even want to call anyone's uh, name out. I mean, I do have respect for, uh, uh, what do you call it? Lee Strobel types, the, the former uh, Chicago Times editor. Uh, people like um, Ligonier, uh, Ligonier Ministries. Um, some of these different minds that do a great job with a lot of biblical principles. But they will not use that same linguistic and contextual and historical skill in order to put to bed this notion of the sanctity of Sunday. They just won't do it. So this is another reason why Shabbat is very important to the people of Israel. It's very important. Oti le'olme'ad be'no uveni. It is a sign she is, or it is, Shabbat, Beno between him, speaking of Yaakov, and by extension his people, Beno Uveni, and between me, is what he's saying. So when you honor and you keep the Shabbat, it should take your mind back to the great calling card, the Exodus from Mitzrayim, that the Most High set up, okay, in order to begin establishing the glory of his name. Now that you know, now that you know you're obligated to do better and or the best that you can. Let's love one another. Let's not beat each other up and let's not become dogmatic over things to where we can't truly and fully know. The Mashiach, when he comes, will gather honey uh, dachot, the dispersed, you know, that have been spread to arbak nafot to the four corners of the earth, and he will fix all things. And it says that his Torah, his Torah in some of the uh, extant extra-biblical writings, says that the Torah of Mashiach will make the one that we have seem almost like folly in that he will make it so clear, that he will make it so understood, um, and that it will be yadua, well-known, or well-known, that the world may know, the world may know that he is, he is, okay? All right, so with that, with that, again, I hope that this video has been uh, a blessing and that it's had uh, something constructive and useful that you can use toward building, toward erecting a structure, everything built on top of the Yesod, the Yesod, the foundation, which is Mashiach Yeshua, Hashlichim, the, uh, the, the disciples, Hanevi'im, and uh, the prophets, and all of these things uh, that's built upon. It's a structure uh, that's being built uh, to eternity forever. Thank you so much for uh, the individual people who have reached out to me um, with respect to the passing of my friend and brother, Enoch Flores, thank you so much for the prayers that you have offered. And the sun is coming up. We're, you know, at least, you know, for me, it's going to be tough for his family moving forward for some time to come. But uh, I am uh, better. I'm feeling better. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, honoring my friend and my brother's uh, memory by continuing to push with Torah uh, and get it into the ears of the people, no matter who you are what you look like. If you got kinky hair like mine and a nose like mine, I love you. You know, if you little melanin deficient and look kind of like a Halloween prop, I still love you. You know, get get a little sun. Get a little sun. Uh, no matter who you are, Latino, whoever, you know, go into the world. Make disciples of all men. Disciples of all men. Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you commanded you. All right? So until next time, Anashim Tovim, Lehitraot, Bapam Habaa, I will see you soon uh, and on 
the next time. All right. Take care. Much love, you guys.